Although the invasion of Poland by the Wehrmacht was a successful campaign and the Germans won rather fast with relatively few losses, it should not be neglected as an insignificant conflict, as the Allies did back then. This brawl becomes more apparent if we take a short look at the First World War, as the military historian Robert Sintino notes. Perhaps Poland was not a true test of the new mechanized German army. It was a second-rate power without modern weaponry. But even countries like Poland had proved to be tough nuts to crack in World War I. Belgium, Serbia, Romania, Bulgaria. Without tanks and aircraft, it is easy to imagine the 1939 campaign resembling the German invasion of Romania in 1916. An impressive win, slightly incomplete and stretching out over four complete months. Now one common view is that the Western Allies were still thinking like in the First World War. But if this is true, then how could they miss this major change in the time scale? Now although the German principles of war changed little over the centuries, because they always focus on short wars with a strong focus on mobility, one key element that allowed the Germans to return to Bewegungskrieg was of course the use of motorized and mechanized units, because they allowed to turn tactical breakthroughs into operational ones. Whereas in the First World War, most tactical breakthroughs often couldn't be properly exploited nor as fast. So what took a few weeks in the First World War could now be done in a matter of days or even faster. So let's take a closer look at the German panzer forces during the invasion of Poland in 1939. The German army in September 1939 in total had 3472 panzers. As you can see, the most numerous tank was the Panzer I, followed by the Panzer II. Both of these were intended for training purposes, but not combat. Whereas the other tanks were quite low in numbers. Note that the Panzer 35T and 38T were of Czech production, and the Panzer Befehlswagen was a command tank based on the Panzer I. Yet what is probably more interesting is how many Panzers were part of the Feldheer, the field army. As you can see, in this case the Panzer II outnumbered the Panzer I. Since the Panzer I was only equipped with machine guns, it was rather limited in its firepower. But let's look at the total firepower in terms of 20mm or above. In total this would be 1151 20mm guns, 308 37mm guns and 197 short barreled 75mm guns. Now, why are these numbers relevant? Although the 37mm tank gun was sufficient in dealing with the few Polish tanks encountered, it was rather unsuited for dealing with anti-tank guns and dug-in infantry. Hence less than 7% of all panzers were capable of effectively engaging anti-tank weapons at larger ranges. This is probably a reason why the Panzer IV, which was equipped with a short barreled 75mm gun, was distributed among the panzer divisions, providing each one with at least a handful. Another unit that had panzers attached, yet lacked Panzer IVs, noted the following. If only a handful of Panzerkampfwagen IV had been assigned, it would have been possible to combat enemy anti-tank nests that often caused heavy losses in men and vehicles. So let's take a look at the panzer divisions. Here the names can be quite misleading. For instance, the 1st Panzer Division and the 10th Panzer Division weren't equal. They later had only one panzer regiment, instead of two. Thus only about half the number of panzers. In total, during the operations in Poland, Germany had five full-sized panzer divisions, with two panzer regiments each. Additionally, there was the Panzer Division Kempf, the aforementioned 10th Panzer Division, and the 1st Leichter Division, which had each one panzer regiment. But let's be honest here, this is clearly not complicated enough. Because if one goes down to battalion level, there's another major difference. Namely, the 3rd Panzer Division had the tank training unit, the Panzer Lehrabteilung, attached. Thus this Panzer Division had 5 Panzer Battalions, whereas the others had usually 4 or 2. Note that the number of Panzer Battalions were reduced during the course of the war. So for the attack on the Soviet Union in 1941, a Panzer Division had usually 2 to 3 Panzer Battalions. As you can see, the devil is in the details. Now let's look at some of the problems the Panzertruppen encountered in Poland. One specific problem of the Panzer I and Panzer II was that the Polish anti-tank rifles could penetrate their frontal armor at ranges above 100 meters. Note that this mainly refers to the Panzer I and the Panzer II variants which had a 13 to 14.5 mm frontal armor. For the Panzer II there were also variants with 30 mm frontal armor that were less susceptible to AT rifle fire. Another major issue was the lack of proper coordination between the Panzers and the infantry. Yet quite often such shortcoming had limited impact to the lack of weaponry and equipment of the Polish forces. 
As an after-action report of the Panzer Regiment 8 points out, the attack was not coordinated between the individual arms. In addition, the marshy area in the front of the bunkers was not scouted to determine whether it could be crossed by the Panzers. Reasons for success? No enemy artillery or minefields? The bunker crews didn't count on German determination. Lessons? While it succeeded once, it is probably not repeatable. This report was part of a questionnaire after the campaign in order to learn from the experiences. This also shows that the Germans took a sober assessment of their various shortcomings and bad practices. Now let's look at the losses, which were quite extensive considering the under-equipped Polish forces and the conditions the Polish forces were facing. It is true that having to go alone against the Wehrmacht presented the Polish high command under General Eduard Rich Smigli with several bad options. It is equally true that he chose the worst one possible, attempting to defend every inch of the country's overlong border. Nevertheless, in total 674 Panzers out of 2859 were knocked out, according to Saloga. This means about 23.6% losses, of which 217 were total write-offs, which means 7.6% lost. Yet another author, Jens, puts that number at 236 write-offs, which means 8.3%. Additionally, he provides a type of Panzers which were exactly lost. And these numbers are quite interesting, because look at the relatively high number of Panzer Freeze lost. Now here are the initial numbers of the field army again for comparison. And as you can see, the percentage of losses for the Panzer Free were almost 30%, whereas from the other types only the Panzer 38T crossed the 10% mark. Sadly, I didn't find any information why exactly the Panzer Free losses were so high in comparison to the other tanks. So if you know why, please let me know in the comment section ideally with a source. Special thanks to Max Ravenclaw for support about the Panzer II front armor issue. As always, sources are linked in the description. If you want to learn more about the invasion of Poland, check out this video from last year. Or maybe you're more interested in the current assessment of the US and Chinese Navy capabilities, then check out this video. Thank you for watching and see you next time.